Imagine a band so explosive and influential that their success was cut short before they even knew it. A band that never quite tasted the full fruits of their success. That would be the untold story of Sublime. In this video, we'll be uncovering the history of the iconic band Sublime from Bradley Noel's early years to the humble beginnings in the vibrant Long Beach neighborhood in their gritty up and coming years in the Southern California music scene. Stay tuned because by the end of the video, you'll gain a deeper understanding of the band's roots, struggles, and the musical influences that drove them to create the music we all know and love. But let's start with the beginning of Sublime. Most bands can relate as a lot of beginnings for bands started this way and Sublime was no different. They were a band struggling to find their sound, playing in backyard parties and dive bars, all while dodging gangster kids and even police helicopters. Sublime's journey is nothing short of extraordinary. Bradley Knoll, the band's frontman and guitarist, grew up in the vibrant neighborhood of Belmont Shore in Long Beach. His parents, with their musical backgrounds, laid the the foundation for his passion. However, Bradley faced a share of challenges, including a disruptive school life and attention deficit disorder. At the age of 11, Bradley embarked on a life-changing sailing trip with his father, introducing him to the mesmerizing world of reggae music, particularly the legendary Bob Marley. Little did he know this trip would shape his future in music. Bradley's journey continued as he joined punk rock bands and eventually, fast forward to 1988, when Noel reunited with bassist Eric Wilson and formed Sublime core lineup. The band's early days were far from glamorous. They struggled with their sound, attempting reggae while facing resistance from their own members. However, the turning point came when they added the drummer Bud Gaw in the mix, forming Sublime's iconic lineup. They began jamming in Gaw's garage. They played at backyard parties and dive bars, often in rough neighborhoods where even the safety was a concern. However, their music was a magnet, drawing crowds to their gigs, and they became the band everyone wanted to see. By 1990, the band adopted a furry friend named Lou dog, who became their mascot and even joined them on tour. The same year, Michael Habilode stepped in to manage the band, offering free studio time and becoming an essential member of the Sublime family. Together, they recorded their demo, Jay Won't Pay the Bills, released in 1991, which catapulted them to a new level of recognition. The band's unique sound, blending punk, reggae, and ska, began to resonate with audiences far and wide, setting the stage for their remarkable journey in the music industry. But as the story goes, like most bands, there were struggles. What were the personal challenges that plagued Sublime's journey? Well, if you looked into their content, their songs vividly portrayed the dark and gritty side of California, a world they knew all too well. Despite frontman Bradley Knoll's initial resolve to stay clear of certain hard drugs, the allure of creativity and the influence of fellow musicians led him down a treacherous path. He believed that he could control his habit, but as often happens in the world of rock and roll, it spiraled out of control, ultimately casting a shadow over the band's future. In 1991, armed with a thousand dollar loan from Noel's father, the band financed and recorded their debut record, 40 Ounces to Freedom, under their own label, Skunk Records, selling copies out of the back of their van. They managed to move around 30,000 units. This early success led them to headline clubs, but two years of hedonistic behavior left them financially drained. To fund their sophomore effort, Robin the Hood, which was released in 1994, the band had to play additional live shows after running out of money for studio time. The album was recorded in an earthquake damaged house with, pi with pirated electricity, showcasing a blend of folk acoustic, rock rap, and spoken word elements. It even featured a duet with No Doubt's Gwen Stefani. However, during this period, Noel's drug addiction worsened, and it became increasingly evident during their live shows. Sublime's live performances were marked by Noel's struggle to make it through songs, and rumors of the band's members overdosing began to circulate. Sometimes Noel even resorted to pawning off the band's equipment while on tour, only for their manager to rescue it in time for their shows. This tumultuous period was immortalized in the song Pawn Shop. Despite their personal turmoil, Sublime had built a strong local following by early 1995, but had yet to gain national attention. This all changed when local LA radio station KROQ added their three-year-old song, Date Expletive, in their rotation. The track became one of the most requested songs, skyrocketing the band's visibility. Curiously, around this time, Sublime stopped including their Date Expletive in their live sets, perhaps due to the song's controversial subject matter. The song revolved around a criminal getting his due in prison and its title raised eyebrows. However, Noel, unapologetic as ever, explained that the song's creation was more about wordplay than a profound message. Despite newfound success, the band still faced distribution challenges. Fans attending their shows in 1995 were left wondering where to find their records. They initially had a deal offer from Gasoline Alley affiliated with the major label MCA, but the deal fell through due to a bizarre meeting in which the band, intoxicated and frustrated from waiting, sent their 
beloved canine companion, Lou Dog, into the executive's office as a surprise. However, half a year later, Gasoline Alley reconsidered and signed the band, improving their distribution and infusing much-needed cash. While they maintained their punk roots, the band's manager acknowledged the harsh realities of the industry, emphasizing the necessity of financial support. The success of Date Expletive propelled 40 Ounce to Freedom and onto the SoundScan alternative rock charts. And now fast forward to Sublime's final album and the tragic loss of Bradley Knoll. As Sublime's journey continued in the summer of 1995, they were invited to perform at KROQ's Weenie Rose Festival. However, instead of appreciating the support from this influential station, they chose to burn bridges. Sublime received 10 backstage passes for the event, but decided to print an additional 300 passes, leading to overcrowding in the backstage area. Despite the stunt, KROQ continued to play their music. During this time, frontman Bradley Knowles' personal life saw some stability as he welcomed his first child, Jacob, with his girlfriend, Troy. As the band regrouped in early 1996 to record their major label debut, No faced immense pressure to deliver. However, initial recording sessions in Redondo Beach, California with Grammy-winning producer David Kane resulted in friction, leading to scrapped sessions. Sublime then turned to Paul Leary, guitarist for the Butthole Surfers, who shared a mutual admiration for the band. They decided to record at Willie Nelson's studio in Austin, Texas to escape distractions. These sessions proved challenging due to Noel's behavior as he struggled drug addiction. The creative process became disjointed and Noel filling tracks with gibberish. His substance abuse took a toll on the band in the studio, leading to incidents like Lou Dog scratching the studio floor and even setting a room on fire. Despite these challenges, Sublime completed their album and Noel and Troy got married in Vegas May 18, 1996. There was hope that Noel had finally overcome his addiction. However, a short West Coast tour in May ended tragically. By the end of the tour, Noel had relapsed leading to a series of parties. In the early hours of May 25th, 1996, Noel called Troy, but she was unaware that it would be their last final conversation. Tragically, on May 25th, 1996, Brad Noel passed away at the age of 28. The circumstances surrounding his death involved a relapse and lethal dose of drugs. It was a heartbreaking end to a turbulent journey, coming at the time when Sublime's major label debut was set to be released and as Noel's son Jacob was about to turn one years old. The band was devastated when drummer Bud Goff, feeling survivor's guilt, believing he should have been the one to go. Troy Noel, in her grief, remembered how Brad had dismissed the struggles of other musicians with addiction issues, only to succumb to the same fate. Bradley Knoll had spent the last five years of his life battling addiction, making multiple attempts at rehab, and even receiving a significant financial support from the record label to get clean. Sublime's third album was later released in July 1996 and became a massive hit, selling over 6 million copies and producing hit singles like Sandaria and Wrong Way. However, the label MCA was not particularly sympathetic to the band's situation. Following Noel's death, there were discussions within the label about finding a new Sublime singer, but the survivor members, Bud Gaw and Eric Wilson refused, feeling that Noel was irreplaceable. In the broader context of the rock music scene in 1996, drug-related issues were prevalent among high-profile bands like Stone Temple Pilots, Pantera, Depeche Mode, Alice in Chains, and Smashing Pumpkins. This prompted the industry to consider establishing health programs for artists, a move met with mixed reactions. Troy, Noel's wife, criticized the record label for not allowing enough time to stay clean and work a recovery program. The aftermath of Noel's death saw several releases featuring leftover songs and surviving members embarked on other musical projects including the Long Beach dub All-Stars. Lou Dog, the band's beloved Dalmatian, was cared for by the group's manager and passed away on September 17, 2001. His ashes were scattered in the same spot as Bradley Knowles. In 2009, the surviving members of Sublime reunited with a new frontman, Rome Ramirez, under the band's name, resulting in a legal battle with Troy and Knowles' estate. They eventually changed their name to Sublime with Rome. Troy has since remarried and Jacob, now in his early 20s, has followed his family's musical footsteps, becoming the frontman of his own Long Beach band, Law. And that wraps it up for the deep dive into the captivating history of Sublime. We hope you've enjoyed the journey with their early struggles, explosive rise, and personal challenges they faced along the way. If you found this video as fascinating as we did, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more incredible stories from the world of music. Remember to stay rocking and turn the dial up to 10 as there are more great stories about your favorite artists that can be found in the description box. Until then, see you in the next video.